Have your Bibles tonight. I'd like to ask you to turn with me to the book of John, and I'll share with you a few thoughts the Lord's placed upon my heart, and then we'll take some prayer requests, and uh, we'll pray over these things together. Lord, it's been so faithful. There have been so many wonderful reports coming in the last few weeks, and how the Lord's hearing and answering prayers, and I'm thankful that He is. And uh, He's got grace that's sufficient, and He has a provision for every need. And I want us to look tonight in the book of John, chapter number 12. And I'm sure these are familiar verses to most, but I'm asking the Lord tonight to help them to be fresh and new to our hearts, and that He would use it to challenge us. And uh, there's so many things in our lives that are lacking on our part. There's nothing lacking on His part, but there's so much lacking on our part. And I found that uh, even whenever you and I try to produce that in our own lives, that we are unable, uh, that without Him we can do nothing. And when it comes to spiritual growth and it comes to um, our walk with Him, that the key to it is abiding. Uh, He said, if you abide in me and I in you, He said, you'll bear fruit. You'll bear more fruit. You'll bear uh, fruit for the glory of the Lord. And I want to be a fruit bearer. Let's look here tonight in John chapter 12. If you're willing and able to stand together, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. John chapter 12, verse 1. The Word of God says, Then Jesus, six days... Before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying, hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you. But me you have not always. Let's stop here and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful tonight that we, first of all, can call you Father. Lord, it's not by anything that we've earned or merited. Lord, not by any work that's been performed, Lord, but it's all because of your grace. Lord, one day you came to us, Lord, in our lost condition. And, Lord, you showed us, Lord, where we stood. And, and, uh, Lord, we were condemned under condemnation. But, Lord, I'm thankful that you didn't leave us there. Lord, where that sin abound, Lord, we know that the grace much more abounded. Lord, we pray and thank you for reaching out your hand of invitation, Lord, and touching our hearts uh, with your truth, knowing faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Lord, you brought us to that place of conviction, brokenness, and repentance where all must come. And Lord, you didn't leave us there, Lord, that you would give us that hand of invitation and said that whosoever shall call upon your name shall be saved. And Lord, I'm thankful Uh, that you saved us, and Lord, you uh, come to abide within us, and Lord, that you've said you'll never leave us nor forsake us, and Lord, you've been so faithful, Lord, to provide for our needs and to give us love and care and direction, and Lord, even to, uh, Lord, uh, to chasten us as we need to be. Lord, I thank you tonight for the precious word of God that you, uh, Lord, uh, have forever preserved in heaven. Lord, I pray tonight you help us to be uh, Lord, not only hearers of the word, but doers, that you challenge our hearts and help us in our desire to be drawn closer to you. Lord, you said if we draw nine to you, you draw nine to us. And Lord, tonight as we, Lord, dig into the scripture, I pray that you'd reveal things, uh, uh, Lord, that would help us in our worship and our service and dedication and devotion unto you. Uh, Lord, we want to bring honor and glory to your name, knowing that if you be lifted up, you draw them in unto you. Lord, I thank you in advance for what you accomplished here tonight. Lord, I pray for the other churches that are meeting together, for the people of God and being assembled together. Uh, Lord, may it be a time of growth in all of our hearts and lives and a time of salvation for those that may be lost. And we ask it all tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Now, we know tonight the Word of God makes it clear uh, that we love Him because He first loved us. Uh, His love is that love in action. And our love is love and reaction. Uh, that we, the more we know about uh, how He loves us and what He's done for us, uh, the more that it tugs upon our heart and we desire to love Him back in return. Uh, I don't know about you, but when it comes to uh, the 
looking at the uh, Easter, or the message of Easter and seeing our Lord crucified and seeing all that he uh, endured for our sin and that love that not only was dis- the, uh, declared, but that love that was displayed, uh, that it uh, amazes me to think the Lord would go to such drastic measures for somebody like me, that he'd die and go through all that for me. Uh, the word of God declared, for God so loved the world, that love is declared and it's displayed and and uh, it uh, causes conviction to come into my heart. And the reason being is because I find myself so unworthy uh, that I find myself coming short so many times uh, that I'm like the Apostle Paul, that I'm uh, uh, struggling all the time with this old flesh and the world's pulling and the flesh is pulling and my heart's desires to want to be fully surrendered and dedicated. I don't want to uh, be a hypocrite when I sing I surrender all. I want to come to the place in my life that the Lord would help me to come to, that I could literally lay my life at his feet and, and let him have every ounce of my being. But I find myself struggling like I believe if we were to be honest that many of us would. And, and there's times when we're dissatisfied with our prayer life and we want it to be at a, another level. There's times that we take and uh, we think about our service and we think about our surrender and our dedication and our witness and and, and uh, we look back and say we're grateful that the Lord has brought us so far in the journey. It's all been because of Him. By the grace of God, I am what I am. But we also know that we haven't arrived yet and if we ever think we have arrived, that's the first clear indication that we have not and that's a good place to stop and repent and ask God to help us. Uh, but what I'm saying is there's room that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I say, thank God tonight, he's still working on me. But in regards to that, that one of the areas that I believe that we fall short in is the area of worship. Uh, giving God that praise and uh, devotion and dedication that he desires. A lot of times our prayer life is filled with us uh, uh, asking for our own needs to be met and asking God for this. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because he tells us to cast all of our care upon him for he careth for us. Uh, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And, and we're interceding for the law, standing in the gap, which we should be doing. Uh, but uh, there's times that we are so busy, uh, concerned and consumed with what's going on around us that we miss and fail to worship the one who's above us. I think there should be times in our life that we set aside, that we simply come to him and just praise him and thank him and, and start going through his names and thinking about his attributes and his mighty works and his grace uh, and on and on. And by the way, that you, don't, you and I don't have to look far to find reason to give him praise and glory. Uh, sometimes we say, well, I thank God because uh, he answered this prayer, did that. But I'm going to tell you this, we ought to thank God even if he didn't answer it the way we prayed it because he's still worthy of it. Uh, but when it comes to this area of worship uh, that we find there's uh, times uh, in our life that we struggle with worship, and, and I believe that there's a few reasons for that, and, and I'm just speaking about my own experiences, but sometimes the reason that we struggle with worship is because real worship involves real sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Many times we want, uh, but we don't want to sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, even when Nehemiah and them was building the wall and, and uh, the... Uh, they came and they, the enemy came up against them and, and they asked the question and said, will these feeble Jews, will they sacrifice? Because if they're willing to sacrifice, if they're willing to pay the price, then we're going to be in trouble. But if they're just talking about it and there's not going to be any emotions to it, if it's all going to be just in words but no deeds behind it, uh, then we don't have anything to worry about. And I'm afraid sometimes with us Christians that we do more times talking about it than actually engaging in it. But we think about it involves sacrifice. It also involves surrender, uh, laying ourselves at his feet. And, and it also involves uh, an element of humility. And we know pride cometh before fall. And uh, we know this old flesh has to be crucified on a daily basis. Uh, but there's still an element in pride. And, and uh, if you don't believe it, I guarantee you tonight, a lot of times what holds us back when it comes to real worship is we're concerned about what somebody will think or say about us going to involve sacrifice, it's going to involve surrender, and it's going to involve humility. And by the way, the Lord is worthy of all that, because as a matter of fact, him being the King of kings and the Lord of glories, that he done all that. He sacrificed, 
no greater sacrifice. He surrendered, laid down his very own life for us that was unworthy. And uh, he was uh, the humility in Philippians chapter number two. We read about that. There's a word that is an interesting word that we don't use very often, but the word called extravagant. And it has the idea of that which is uh, uh, excessive or, or waste for or beyond what's reasonable. It has the idea uh, of uh, spending too much or being exaggerated or uh, fleshy or, or showy. And uh, the ideas of somebody going overboard, and most of the time we use that word, we think of it in a negative sense. Uh, by the way, when you look here in the text, you find this woman by the name of Mary that she gave a gift to Jesus that some would consider to be excessive, uh, overboard, uh, or beyond what was reasonable. As a matter of fact, they uh, was criticizing her, or at least one was, and that was Judas, uh, because of what she had done. But that didn't that discourage her, and it did not stop her. But when it comes to the word extravagant, most of the time it's thought about in a negative way that if we were to take the blessings that God gives us and squander it away on a worldly or fleshly things or use it in a way that's being a poor steward of what God has given us, then uh, we can say, yes, that's a negative thing. But however, whenever a person expresses their love and dedication and devotion to the Lord and they do it in an extravagant manner and they uh, don't hold back anything but give God everything, uh, tonight there's nothing negative about that and it should be a place that all of us desire to reach in our own lives uh, for his glory uh, no gift is too expensive no uh, act of love is overboard or no form of worship should be ever considered uh, to be too much when it comes to our lord because he's worthy of every single thing that you and i have to offer him we find here mary that she uh, displays uh, uh, an act of uh, sacrifice here uh, we read that she took uh, this ointment and she uh, took and she poured it on Jesus' feet and she took her hair and wiped his feet. But when you read in the book of Mark, chapter number 14, verse number 3, the Word of God says that she broke that uh, box uh, of that uh, precious, costly ointment that uh, spikenard. And uh, she didn't just put it on his feet, but she put it on his head. Uh, whenever we uh, see this that she done, that we read down in verse number 3. And then took Mary a pound uh, of ointment uh, uh, of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled uh, with the odor of the ointment. Uh, when you read down in verse number five that you find that uh, Simon, that he had to open his mouth and say something negative and he said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Uh, that 300 pence may not mean a whole lot to us today, uh, but it was uh, one pence was equivalent to an average daily worker's uh, wages back then. And 300 was almost a year's worth of wages. Uh, you and I, that we live in a country where the income varies uh, depending upon a, a person's uh, job, whatever their career might be, and, and all this. But I don't know what the average medium income is in the United States of America. Uh, but uh, if you think about the average daily wage and you take an, an almost a year's worth of wages that at one time, one moment, that every bit of that uh, was poured out on a Lord and Savior. Now, you and I know that he's worthy of that, but this, this spikenard uh, was a, uh, it came from a, a plant. It was produced from a plant that was found in India. It was uh, very uh, costly and it was uh, hard to acquire. And a person would usually spend a big part of their life or at least many years trying to get enough to, to have in order for them to have the proper burial. And whenever you think about this, that she took this uh, box of ointment and she uh, break it, according to Mark 14, verse number three. Uh, some have asked the question over the years, wonder why she uh, broke the box. And I've heard all kinds of different opinions and ideas. And some of them was based upon some ancient customs that took place back in those days. And, and uh, they would take and uh, it was called the breaking of the glass. And if a distinguished person was invited to a home of somebody else as a guest, uh, they would give them a glass to use. And after they used that glass and they left, they would break that glass, preventing anybody that they would consider to be of a lesser position of using that because they said that they wasn't worthy for anybody else to use the glass after it had been used by somebody of a, such a stature of importance. Uh, then also we read there's times that they would break a, uh, that box of ointment and they would anoint the body for burial and then they would place the box in uh, with that individual. 
Uh, I don't know tonight what it might have been of her motivation and reason, but when we read about Mary and you see her devotion and dedication to the Lord, this leads me tonight to believe that probably the reason that she broke it is because she wanted to make sure that she got uh, every single ounce of that oil out, that she didn't want to leave anything behind. The Lord Jesus said she hath done what she could do. And I wonder tonight when it comes to uh, our lives, uh, I wonder tonight uh, how many of us have allowed uh, our lives to be broken and every ounce of our being being poured out to use for God's glory. I want my life to be a vessel that the Lord could use. The Word of God said in Mark 14, 8, that she hath done what she could do. It means that she didn't hold anything back. I had read back uh, uh, many years ago, there was a Christian businessman that had went over to Korea, and uh, he was going to do some things over there, and he didn't know how to navigate. He didn't know the language, and he had a contact of a Christian missionary over there, and the missionary said, I'll come and I'll escort you around and uh, take you where you need to go, and I'll interpret for you. And so they were uh, out on their first outing, and they was on the outskirts of uh, the town and back in the little countryside, and said that as they were navigating along, that uh, the Christian businessman, he said, stop. I said, I, I, I want you to stop here a minute. And they stopped, and he, he pulled out his camera, and he looked down in the field and said there was a, a young Korean boy down there uh, up uh, to his ankles in mud, and he had a harness connected to him and was hooked to a plow, and he was sweating and, and uh, uh, digging and pulling that plow, and there was an older Korean uh, man that was holding the handles and navigating, and uh, this Christian businessman, he said, I've never seen anything like this before. He started taking pictures, and he said, they must really be poor over here in this country, and the uh, missionary said, well, said, you're right, said, they're very uh, poor over here. They had limited resources. Uh, he said, but I know this couple. He said, that's the father and the son, said the mother and the wife. She's at home and said, this family, said they're a member of our church. And he said back several years ago that we had felt led by the Lord to build a, a new church and said that we needed the resources to build and said there was a limited uh, amount of giving that could be done. Our congregation, most are like them and have very little. And said this family was broken and burdened because they wanted to give something to the Lord and they wanted to do something to express their love and devotion and said they didn't have anything to give. And said so they took their ox, the only one ox they had, and said they sold that ox and they took the money out of that ox and they gave it to the building program and helped us to get one step closer to building our building and said this Christian Christian businessman he said my goodness he said that must have really been a great sacrifice for them he said well to talk to them they don't call it sacrifice at all he said they said they were fortunate that the Lord had blessed them with an ox that they had to sell yeah, sure. said the, the Christian businessman got back to the states he called his wife in. He said, you know, said I've seen something over there that touched my heart. And he said, we've always been faithful in our giving to the Lord, and we've tried to do that which God's desired of us. And he said, we've tried to give it out of desire, not duty. He said, but you know, most of our giving has been out of abundance. And he said, our giving has never really involved any real sacrifice. And he said, the Lord touched my heart after what I witnessed and I saw. And he said, I want us to double our giving and ask God to enable us to be able to give more to him. And said so they've done that. I'm telling you tonight that real worship is going to involve sacrifice. I'm not just talking about giving of money. I'm talking about giving ourselves and giving our time and uh, giving our resources to God. By the way, uh, we're not really giving it to him anyway. It's already his. We're just asking God uh, to show us how we can use it for him. Uh, that uh, this uh, worship that took place here that not only did it involve sacrifice, but it had involved some uh, surrender as well. In order for Mary to anoint the feet of Jesus, that she had to kneel down and get at his feet. Uh, that she's making a tremendous statement by doing this as to who she believes that Jesus is. In those days, there was only four classes of people that was anointed. And one of those uh, uh, would have been the king's. And uh, we know the Lord was worthy to be anointed as a king, that he fulfilled the office of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, but he is the uh, king of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, another that would, would have been anointed in those days was uh, uh, the priest. 
And you and I know that Jesus, that he, according to the Hebrew writer, that he is the great high priest. And he did what no other priest could ever do as he entered in and offered one sacrifice for sin forever. And he sat down after he had declared the work of a sacrifice was finished when he offered himself. And he's the great high priest. And thank God, according to Hebrews 7.25, that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Uh, worthy of that anointment. Uh, then there was the prophets, and the Lord Jesus fulfilled the office of the prophet as well. Uh, perfect in every order, every word he said, that perfect. And then the last class was those of the dead. Jesus, you and I know that he died for our sin. Amen. But thank God we read in Revelation uh, that he was dead, but thank God he is alive forevermore. Forevermore. Uh, but it's amazing when you think of uh, uh, what uh, Mary had done here. And uh, when uh, she, I believe she had an insight to what was going on, maybe even at a greater capacity than his own very closest disciples did. You said, why was Mary so in touch with Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because every time you find Mary, she's at his feet. Amen. And you hang around his feet long enough and you're going to have an insight. I believe tonight that we can be as close to the Lord as we want to be to him. I've heard people say, I'll tell you one thing, I sure wish I could be close to the Lord like brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so, or preacher so-and-so. I'm going to tell you tonight, God is no respect of a person. Amen. And you and I can be as close to Him as we want to be. Amen. And we should desire to be closer and closer to Him, and to walk with Him, and to hear His voice, and, and to spend time with Him. And it's not a duty, uh, it should be a desire in all of our hearts. But Mary's willing to do the work of a common slave, and she wasn't ashamed of uh, this act of humility uh, that she let her hair down and that might not sound like much to us but back then for a woman to let their hair down was a symbol and a sign of a, an immoral woman that it was a disgrace it was undignified and I'll tell you what I believe I believe she got so consumed with worshiping the Lord uh, that she didn't care what anybody said and uh, she didn't care what anybody thought and uh, she knew he's worthy and she wasn't willing to uh, let pride stand in the way and she said I'm just going to worship him Amen. can you imagine what our churches would be like Amen. if we would let the brakes off Amen. and we'd worship God like we have in our heart to do Amen. but I remember back whenever the Lord had saved me and I was in church, and we was in a church where the, it, was, uh, it was so blessed to have the Lord just show up. So many, I mean, the services was always spirit-filled, and there was liberty. Had wonderful preaching, great pastor, and had people that wasn't ashamed of the Lord would stand up and testify. And like we've experienced here, and just a precious, precious, sweet spirit. But I, I remember one time I was sitting back near the back, and uh, I was sitting on a pew and the preacher was preaching and the Lord began to stir in my heart and I felt something well just coming on the inside and I felt like it needed to be expressed not I was scared I was bashful I was timid and I the last thing I ever wanted to do was draw any attention to myself but I felt like I wanted to shout I wanted to lift my hand I wanted to do something but I just had something on the inside that wanted to get to the outside but you know what I did I suppressed it I held it in. You know what? God, he's worthy for us to let it out. Amen. Now, I'm not saying do something in the flesh to make a scene, but I'm talking about if there's something on the inside that God's done in your heart and it needs to come to the outside, you and I shouldn't be ashamed of it. Right. If a shouting and praising the Lord makes you uncomfortable here, it's sure going to make you uncomfortable when you get to heaven. But I'll tell you, there's going to be a whole lot of singing and shouting and praising going on. And we might as well go ahead and do it here on this side that, and, and be in practice before we get on that side. But I remember I couldn't stand it any longer. And I said, Amen. <laughs> and then I looked to see who heard me because I was embarrassed. I'm going to tell you this, God convicted my heart. And he said, I, I'm not ashamed of you. Why are you ashamed of me? And the next time, it was a little bit easier. And the next time, it was a little bit easier. And I never lift my hand or said amen ever to just join in with the crowd or just to do it to be doing it. But when there was something in my heart, 
that needed to get out. I didn't want to hold it back. And I'm going to be honest with you. The Lord's helped me over the years, but I still am not to where I need to be. All of us hold back. We find here she didn't hold back. Not only did she surrender her possession, but she surrendered her pride. She didn't care the gasp and the stares and the uh, little whispers that was going on, uh, that she was so consumed with his glory that she's worthy uh, for whatever, and she wanted to, to, to give him. You know what? She got over her pride and she got at his feet. And you and I need to get over our pride, spend some more time at his feet. I want you to notice this. And we're going to be done here in a moment, take some prayer requests. But we read that she was at his feet and she took that very costly spikenard and she anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his hair with her feet with his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor uh, of the ointment. Uh, that uh, Mary is an interesting individual. That there's three times uh, in the gospel accounts that Mary... Uh, I don't necessarily want to say take center stage because it's never about us. It's always about the Lord. But there is times that the Holy Spirit has a, allowed Mary to come to surface. And it was only because that she was lifting Christ up. But every time you find Mary, she's at the feet of Jesus. Whenever they was there in her own home with Martha, and Martha was busy, and she's serving, and she's cumbered about with all this business, and, and looks over, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, uh, and Martha's so upset and wants Jesus to scold Mary, and the Lord said, no, Mary hath done the better part. I'm not going to scold her, because she, she's in a good place. Yes. Amen. Whenever Lazarus was resurrected from the dead... Whenever Jesus comes on the scene, Mary runs out there and she's at his feet again. And right here, a third time, we see Mary that she's at his feet. And every time we see these accounts, there's like a progression that's taking place. The first time she is at his feet, she was listening to his words and she was learning. Second time that she was... Uh, she was there and she was leaning on him. Her heart was broken over what had happened to her brother. And she's desiring the Lord's work and him to do something. And, and Lord, if you'd been here, our brother wouldn't have died. And, uh, but he's dead. And Lord, we need your help. And Lord, my heart's broken. Uh, but now she's not there uh, just learning. And she's not there just leaning. She's not there just uh, listening to uh, uh, his words or uh, just there to, uh, to ask for his work. But she's there because she's loving on him. And she is expressing his worth and his worthiness. When I look at this, we have to ask ourselves tonight, is our worship involving that steady progression? We spend time in his word desiring to hear from him. And then we're able to see every day in our lives God working in our lives and working around our lives and working in this world. And we know that he that keepeth Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. And every day if we look, we'll find somewhere that Jesus is at work. Even when you don't think he's listening, he's listening. And even when you think he's not working, he's working. He's always uh, on duty. He's always dealing with hearts. He's always meeting needs. And there's so much that he's doing. I say praise God. Thank the Lord that uh, his work and creation is finished. Uh, his work and salvation is finished, but his work and glorification is continuing on in our heart, and he's sanctifying and, and helping us uh, uh, be more like him, and I praise his name. But we think about this, that it uh, shouldn't be hard for us to have reason to worship him. I mean, after all, I should be in hell today, but I thank God that I'm not. When you read in the book of Mark, chapter 14, they're at the house of Simon the leper. They're at a table, and one of the individuals at the table is Lazarus. Now, this is pretty amazing. Why? Because you turn back a few pages, and Lazarus is not sitting at the table with the master. He's been put in a tomb. And they've already put a stone there. And they said, Lord, he's been dead now long enough. He's going to be stinking. But the Lord told him to move the stone. Yeah. And that act of obedience was able to open the door for God to perform a miracle. God could have done it anyway. Amen. But I believe this act of obedience 
honored God and God honored that. And God said, Lazarus, come forth. He loosed him of those grave clothes. I guarantee you that he never forgot that day. He said, Lazarus, you remember the day the Lord gave you a new life? He'd say, how in the world could you ever forget that? I was dead. He spoke my name. And he gave me deliverance. I'm going to tell you, I wasn't like Lazarus that way, but I was dead in my trespass and sin. And I remember on that Sunday morning, June of 1980, that the Holy Spirit spoke my name, and God dealt with my heart. And I remember I came to that altar and asked God to come into my heart, forgive me of my sin. And I stood up that morning and felt like I was 10 foot tall. I used to say, Preacher, do you remember when you got saved? I said, how in the world could I ever forget it? I passed from death to life, and I don't believe tonight you can go from death to life. And not know that it happened. It wasn't a progression. It was instant. God saved my wretched soul. But now Lazarus is sitting at the master's table when he used to be on the deathbed. I'm glad tonight we're able to sit at his table. In a spiritual sense, God's feeding us right now from his word. But one of these days, in a literal sense, we're going to be At his table. Amen. Amen. But I thought to myself, if anybody should have been worshiping Jesus, don't you think Lazarus should have been one of the first ones? I mean, look what God just done in his life. Then they're at the house of Simon the leper. God delivered him from leprosy. He had to cover his mouth and cry out unclean and had to go outside the camp and was separated from his family and all that. And, and the Lord made a way for him to be reunited with his loved ones and what he'd done for him. And if anybody should have been worshiping the Lord, you'd certainly think it had been at least Lazarus or Simon. Right. Yeah. And then there's Martha. She just witnessed her brother being raised from the dead. And I don't mean to be critical tonight, but you know what she's doing? She's doing what she knew to do, and she was serving. She's always working, and that's a wonderful quality of any Christian to have is the desire to want to do something for God's glory, to serve. Servants. We have a lot of people today, and they say, I want to volunteer so-and-so. Or, Lord, here am I. I send them. But you know tonight what we need to be is servants for the Lord. Steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain in the Lord. But not only was she working, but sometimes we find that she was worrying. There's, there's, it's a wonderful thing to be serving God. But don't ever let our service for the Lord take priority over our devotion to the Lord we got to let God work in us before God can work through us Acts chapter number 1 verse number 8 said but after the Holy Ghost come upon you shall be witnesses the emphasis is not on witnessing the emphasis is on being when we become what God wants us to become we'll do the rest of it but you can do without being but you can't be without doing and when you get at the feet of Jesus, God will change our heart and nobody have to twist our arm to be in his house. Nobody have to, uh, to, uh, to scold us to get us to give. It'll come natural because we'll have that desire. But Martha, she, she could have been worshiping too, but she's too busy working. But then you think about the disciples. And then lastly, notice Judas. We ain't said much about Judas But look at Judas, verse number four. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag and bare what was put therein. You know, he's thinking, he's thinking about, boy, what I could have done with that. In his mind, he's thinking, What a waste. This was a waste. Nothing you ever do for God is a waste. There's no better thing that we can do. And uh, the Lord, uh, he he said, let her alone against the day of my burying. Has she she kept this? 
You know what's interesting is all eyes was on Jesus until Judas started complaining and criticizing and finding fault. And now it's took their eyes off Jesus. Can I say tonight, Lord, help us not to ever be like Judas in that sense. If you want to look hard enough, you can find always find something to complain about. You can always find something that don't uh, suit your agenda just like you thought it should. You can always find something that'd like to be different. Well, I love this and this and this and this, but we don't need the buts. I'm not talking about compromising truth, but I'm talking about tonight. There's a time whenever it's best not to say anything. Amen. If all we can say is something negative. Right. And what happens a lot of times in an average church is all eyes are on Jesus until somebody gets to griping and complaining and criticizing. And all of a sudden the focus is taken off him yeah. and it's put where it should never be. Amen. I pray the Lord not let that happen here. Amen. Lord, convict us if we've been guilty of it. When you read in the book of Mark chapter number 14 and in verse number 8, the Lord said, She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. He said, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever the go this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Amen. You know what was happening tonight? You and I are talking about what she did. Yeah. Because the Lord said, I want it to be noted. Yeah. Yeah. Because he said, I was pleased with what she done. Yeah. If God was pleased with her surrender and her sacrifice and her humility, then I want to pattern myself after her example. Amen. I want the Lord to be able to say that pastor had done what he could do rather than he didn't do what he should have done or he didn't do what he could have done. Yeah. I wonder tonight, has our vessels been broken and we really allowed the Lord to help us to pour our lives out on the altar of sacrifice for his glory. I can't say for you tonight, but in my own self, that I'm not where I want to be. But I pray God help me to get there. Amen. Amen. And get there soon. Amen. Thank God for where he's brought me from. Thank God for where he's taken me to. But I want to be everything that he wants me to be right now. Amen. Right now. Amen. Amen. We're going to stop here, and uh, we're going to take some prayer.